Hey guys, happy Friday and happy Raging Bull Market. Today on the Final Bar, we'll talk about this nice way to finish the weekend. Strong finish and a strong move through the course of the day, recovering from weakness earlier this week. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Final Bar. everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts. The stock charts platform was built by our founder, Chip Anderson, for three reasons. To give you the right tools and, uh, and capabilities to analyze the markets, to educate you on how to do it more effectively, and to provide expert commentary. Those that have come before you uh, teaching you the lessons they've learned, uh, hard-fought lessons through uh, a career in the uh, financial industry. We hope this show gives you a little sprinkle of all three of those different components. And what we'll talk about today is really continuing the conversations we've had this week about signs of strength and signs of weakness. It's been sort of a bifurcated market in some ways, right, in terms of a, a, uh, a combination of bullish and more constructive and bearish, more, uh, I guess, less constructive uh, inputs. Netting out to a nice positive move for the S&P today, finishing up uh, just about 39.70. Uh, wanted to uh, start off the show today doing our Wrap the Week segment, but first wanted to give you a poll. So we asked you recently on our social media accounts, so make sure you follow us on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV and at Stock Charts. Uh, also on our live stream page at StockCharts.com, we asked you, where do you see the S&P 500 index one month from today? Your choices were at least 10% higher, at least 10% lower, or within 10% of current levels. 64% of you, two out of three, actually gave that as your answer, which is actually pretty interesting to me because that says most of us, literally two out of three, would say we're going to kind of end up not far from where we're at right now. So what I wanted to do is just bring up a simple chart of the S&P 500. What I'm going to do is add a little extra room at the end. And we're going to take a quick uh, quick analysis on 10% up or 10% down from current levels. The easiest way I know to do that is use the percentage change tool. So 10% up would get us around 43.50, 43.60, we'll call it. That would take us right up to the August high and even a hair above that. 10% down below current levels. And again, I'm just kind of fudging this for uh, for brevity. 10% down would basically be a retest of the new uh, the new low in October. That would take us below 3,600. So only 10% of you said we'd be over 4,360 or below 3,560, uh, we'll call it, uh, in, uh, in the next month. And most of you said we'd be somewhere within this range. If I was voting in this poll, I would probably agree with you. And I think it comes back to what we've talked about with a lot of our guests. Right? My conversation with Tom Boley was about sort of this sideways market, right? In his opinion, the bottom was in June, and, and he, he very loudly and vocally uh, proclaimed that. Even though we made a new low, the bottoming process arguably had begun in his opinion. And I can't disagree with the fact that if you look at where we're at right now, around 3970, and you look at where we were in May of last year, was 3970. So since May to now, we haven't gone anywhere directionally. We've been going sideways. And so it's rethinking this as a downtrend. And we're at the upper end of the channel to the downtrend was the first half of the year. And now we're just consolidating. We're in this big bottoming process. Now, for me, how do you differentiate between the two? I would say the proof is in the price, right? So if the price shows you that this is no longer a channel, if the price shows you that we're more, uh, you know, breaking that, and this is more of a consolidation resolving, resolving upwards, I think the chart will show you that. And I think the best way it does it is by breaking above that green trend line we've talked about, right? Getting above 4,000, which is where we're at, uh, where it's at right now. Today, we close literally at the 200-day moving average, which is pretty uh, which is pretty interesting for sure. As we continue this wrap of the week, let's look at what happened today and just break down some of the movements. Then we'll look at the weekly returns. We had a shortened holiday week this week uh, with Monday off. So we'll look at the last four trading days and what they meant. And then we'll finish off looking at some other supporting charts to sort of round out this uh, time together before the break. Yesterday and the day before, we talked about the weakness 
in the major averages going into the close. And a lot of time that's a really interesting tell because that's where a lot of institutions will actually make their uh, trades. They don't do as much during the day and during the day. First 30 minutes of trading is usually more retail. It's a lot of reaction to what happened pre-open uh, after the close yesterday, all of that pre-market trading. Uh, the last hour is essentially where institutions will start to move. And they do that intentionally because if they would do something big in the middle of the day, it has a chance to really um, shock the markets and make things a lot more difficult to do other things through the course of the day. So waiting till the end is usually what institutions would tend to do. And I'm generalizing greatly here. Uh, but that's usually thought of as more of the institutional hour uh, in the uh, in the tape. So the last couple of days going weaker there at the end of the day is interesting. Now, today, you've got quite a move to the upside. You have an expiration day. This is the January expiration day for options. So there's usually a, a lot of volume. There's usually a lot of stuff happening. I'm always hesitant to derive too many big long-term conclusions on options expiration because that's kind of when a lot of things are happening artificially, right? A lot of buying and selling has to happen because of rolling over options contracts. Having said that, I, I always go back to the most important thing is price. And for what it's worth, the S&P was up almost 2% today. That's not a small move based on recent standards. That's up uh, just above 3970, not quite to that 4,000 level we've talked about, but getting ever closer and a lot closer than we were certainly at yesterday's close when we closed around 3,900. NASDAQ composite going up almost 3% today, and it was the FANG sectors leading the way higher. Communication services, technology, consumer discretionary, all up over 2% with uh, communication services uh, up the most, up over uh, 3%. Um, all the sorts of buckets of names that we would look at, mid cap, small cap, mega cap, all having a pretty decent day up one5 to 2% for those indexes that I just mentioned. And the VIX back below 20. And that could be an interesting data point to uh, pay attention to. One of our mailbag questions here, the first one is going to deal with the VIX. So I'll save a chart of the VIX for then uh, because we have some things to talk about when we, we think about with how the VIX is actually constructed and uh, what the implications could be. Looking at other asset classes, uh, stocks up big today, bonds down pretty big today. Not huge, but, but certainly down a decent amount. The TLT, which is a long treasury ETF, uh, sort of a long bond uh, ETF. Uh, down 1.6%. Interest rates all going up across the board uh, with 10-year yields just below 3.5%. Touch 3.5% around lunchtime and long bond yields around 365 today, which is up about a full point from where we were yesterday. Um, the dollar index, by the way, no real change. This was not one of those super weak dollars, so everything else is up types of days. It was more of a rotational day from, from what I would uh, how I would describe it. Commodities a little bit mixed, although the broader commodity complex doing just fine. Gold down a bit. Uh, today, along with natural gas prices as well. Cryptocurrency is going kind of vertical, and that's in line. It, it's a little different. These are not the same time frame. So Bitcoin and Ether trade 24 hours, as you probably would know. So don't look at this chart and look at the S&P or Dow chart and think that these are the same time frames. It's a little deceiving because it's looking at a 24-hour period, essentially, for each of these little pieces. This acceleration to the upside is really more in line with the equity market open and how uh, risk assets sort of move to the upside. So Bitcoin back above 22,000, that's up 6%. Ether up 6% as well, uh, around 1643 uh, as we're uh, recording the show. Uh, just other observations on what we saw today. Obviously, some big movements on some key names. I mentioned the sectors that were working, things like communication services, technology, consumer discretionary. Things that underperformed were some of the more defensive parts of the market. Healthcare, everything was up, right? So, so everything was up at least a little bit. Healthcare uh, up a half a percent. Utilities up 0.6%. Consumer staples up 0.8%. So all, all equities had a pretty decent day for the most part, but certainly the leadership came from those uh, FANG sectors. I want to go down a little bit to what I call the Menomina group. This is an adaptation of the FANG, which then became the FAN mag. And then I keep adding uh, letters. I'm going to run out of reasonable acronyms to use for this, but Menomina is what I've settled in on. And that's Microsoft, Apple, Meta, Amazon, NVIDIA, Alphabet, Netflix, Adobe. Those are the eight stocks that we're representing. You can see here I have a chart list that uh, refers to these. And I'm just looking at the percent change today. And if you wonder why the benchmarks were up so much, here's your answer, right? Netflix up 8.5%. They reported earnings after the close yesterday. Tom Boley, my guest uh, yesterday, uh, and I were talking about uh, the chart of Netflix and what we might want to see. And it was up a couple percent in the aftermarket, really accelerated through the course of the day today. NVIDIA up 6.5%. And strength in semiconductors is not a phrase I've uttered too much over the last 12 months. But you're certainly starting to see some renewed strength on my, on my scan for new swing highs earlier uh, this week. And certainly in previous weeks, we've seen some of those names pop up. 
And Alphabet, which has honestly been one of the best examples of the accumulation phase in 2021, the distribution phase in 2022, gapping higher, trading right up to uh, $100 a share. Let's look at a couple of these in a little more uh, detail. We'll talk about what they uh, what they mean. Here's the chart of Netflix. And, and what's interesting about the chart of Netflix, I was, I was thinking about it earlier. Um, the, the, the story in the first half of the year was the underperformance in the fangs. And Netflix and Meta really were the two that were getting bombed out the other, uh, you know, Apple, Microsoft hanging in a little bit better, but these two names in particular are really getting crushed. Then they bottomed out, this one in particular bottomed out in May. From there, you see this rotation to the upside. And just look at this incredibly orderly advance, right? Higher highs, higher lows. We've had pullbacks. They've rarely gone much below the 50-day moving average. The RSI has remained in a bullish phase, so has not gotten below 40 in the last uh, six or seven months. Relative strength is consistently positive. Would I be happy with a portfolio of charts that look kind of like Netflix? 100%. And not just today, right? In the months leading up to today, I would argue that's a fairly reasonable chart. Those are the kind of classic examples of names I would probably want to have in a uh, in an actionable portfolio. Amazon's an interesting one. Do you know how, what, what Amazon is, is has done year to date? Now, year to date is just this little bit with today's rally, it's up 15% year to date. What's interesting about year to date returns, particularly early on, 15% in the first couple of weeks sounds amazing. It's like, great. Why did I not own Amazon? I'll tell you why you probably don't own Amazon or probably didn't own Amazon maybe until, until recently is because Amazon's making a new 52 week low going into the, into the first week of this year, right? We almost made a new, we made a new intraday low the first week in January. We've turned and gone up 15%, but the deception or the, I guess, the uh, deceiving part of those gains off the lows, you have to remember, we're still down how much from 185, which is where uh, Amazon was in uh, November, right? So in the last year, we've lost a ton. Up 15% is great, but up 15% after down 50, a lot less awesome. So let's be clear, Amazon, I think, still has a lot more to uh, a lot more to prove. I did want to look at what I call the wrap the week chart. This is just a great chart that summarizes um, the uh, overall uh, performance over the last week. And I do like to set the stage so we can start to think about uh, the week to come here. The S&P 500 is here in black. Nice update, which leaves it a negative week, but not by much, down 0.7%. Small caps underperformed. They were down 1.1% uh, over the last uh, the last four trading days. Everything else outperformed the S&P. Uh, we have bond prices down half a percent using the TLT. Here's the dollar, essentially flat for the week. Gold up a bit, about a third of a percent. In pink, we have the NASDAQ 100 up 0.6%, leading the way higher. We have emerging markets up 1.1%. This is uh, crude oil prices, which uh, had a very decent week, up 2.1%. We had Bitcoin in the mix. And uh, going back to uh, last Friday's session, up 12%. So you're seeing that acceleration, sort of a risk-on feel, not as risk-on until today, but today really putting an exclamation point on a potential recovery. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the Final Bar Mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, guys. Welcome back to the Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Such a pleasure to put this show on for you. And thank you so much for being a part of it. As we continue to grow this uh, this show over the uh, the next uh, twelve months and beyond, a couple quick announcements before we continue on with the final bar mailbag. First is our mailbag is populated by questions from people like you. Whatever comes up as you are using stock charts, using the technical toolkit, and trying to answer the questions that come up in your own process, let us know how we can help. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar sctv. And we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Chart YouTube channel. We'll hope to answer one of your questions when we have another mailbag early next week. Go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. I had such a great time with our guests this week, Dana Lyons, uh, Tom Boley, Ms. Schneider. Had some really good conversations. All of those interviews are available for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Our upcoming schedule is going to be pretty packed with uh, with some solid interviewees. As I mentioned, we've had some really good guests recently. Next week on Tuesday the 24th, we have Willie Delwich, who's the chief strategist at All Star Charts, more of a macro strategist, some really good charts he usually brings along with him. On Wednesday the 25th, Katie Stockton, founder of Fair Lead Strategies, portfolio manager of the TAC ETF. On Thursday, January 26th, David Hunter, a true contrarian who tends to bring some aggressive targets with him for the S&P 500 and interest rates, might want to tune into that one next Thursday, the 26th. 
I will be doing a free webinar next Tuesday, the 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern called The Morning Coffee Routine. I tend to get a lot of questions about my morning coffee routine. I have a series of charts that I uh, publish on the uh, on the Stock Charts platform as part of my chart pack, really going through some of the key charts that I reflect on and review every morning. Sign up for that event and I will show you what my morning coffee routine is. We'll talk about the importance of routines, particularly the order of the information that you analyze. To sign up for that free event, go to marketmisbehavior.com slash coffee. Let's continue on our show today with the final bar mailbag. And let's get right to question number one. Dave, how does the substantial increase in daily or zero DTE options affect the VIX? It's a really good question. If you don't know what that uh, means, that zero DTE uh, stands for zero days to expiration. It's basically short term uh, uh, options. These were uh, released in 2022. So um, I would argue that it's actually still very much an unknown. And so my, my short answer is I'm not sure. Um, and and the, the longer, somewhat longer answer is it's not just me. I've actually talked to some really knowledgeable options experts, people like Larry McMillan and others, people who worked with Bernie Schaefer uh, and many others who are, you know, uh, deep experience for decades trading options. This is very much unknown territory in terms of what they are and what the structures are, how you can use them. That's pretty. I think that's pretty straightforward. And, and they've become incredibly liquid. And to be honest, the zero day DTE uh, options are becoming way more liquid than a lot of the longer term options uh, very, very quickly. The, the question mark is how it impacts things like the VIX. So we've had this issue where the market sort of chopping around and volatility didn't really increase, right? We have the market being sort of choppy recently, but the VIX is remaining low. And the question is, is are the zero day DTE options impacting that? So what you have to remember, two things I would say and, and what I've learned so far, and I'll keep talking around and asking around on, on what sort of impact they may have on things like the VIX and the put call ratios. Number one, remember that the VIX actually doesn't look at those particular options. It's looking at options out a little bit further, about a one month out, if I remember right, uh, on the S&P. And so it's it's a little bit different. It's actually not using those directly. The question is, does the activity in the short-term options impact some of those others? And that's sort of a, a, an open question. So directly, the VIX is not including those in its calculations. How is it changing how this indicator behaves and, and even more so the put call ratio? And if you look at the put call ratio, you can see that it's kind of all over the place. The raw data is in gray. This was before the zero TD, DTE options. This is after. So the raw data in gray, you can see it's obviously become a much more noisy uh, environment. So open question. What I would say is smoothing this kind of data out, particularly daily data like the put call ratio, I think is going to become more and more important. It's something I've done historically. I'm probably going to be looking at how I smooth out the data to see if there's some better ways to think about it in more of a long-term perspective. So that's my initial answer to your question. I'm going to keep uh, digging into it. And uh, and thanks so much for uh, for asking about it. Question number two, why don't you talk more about scooters, SCTR rankings on your show? Also, how does the scooter ranking stack up as an indicator of near-term momentum versus MACD, PPO, and RSI? That's a really good question. So my first, first answer is I do talk about scooter rankings pretty regularly. And what I do is often refer to their number. I refer to their current value because I've often found it's a great way to focus on the charts that are relatively strong and the charts that are relatively weak. That's been an ongoing question for technical analysts and investors for for uh, you know for many many moons. Is figuring out where how do you lean into what's working and lean away from what's not working, or how do you focus on charts in different phases? I found the scooter rankings to be a really good way to uh, identify those. Now, I think what you're referring referring to a little bit uh, differently is actually using the scooter rankings as an indicator. And I'm going to bring up. One of these, I think like Greg Schnell's chart would probably have skis, usually pretty good for that. Yeah. So this is one of Greg Schnell's kind of default chart styles that I that I dug up. Um, I'm going to look at this. Uh, let's see. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And let's also, um, let's see, bring in a little more data. One year. So when I do this, this top series in black, this line is the scooter ranking over time. So you can see with first solar sort of chopping around here in uh, spring, summer of uh, last year, you can see the scooter ranking relatively low. Here's the scale over here, down in the 30, 40th uh, percentile. Then you all of a sudden see this gap higher in July. And while the markets were tanking and, and sort of coming off the August peak and rolling over into an October low, first solar is actually in an uptrend, which is why it immediately becomes one of the stronger names. 
I don't tend to use it as an indicator because for me, the scooter ranking is less about the predictive nature and more about the recognition of the trend. It more defines what the trend has been. I like using other indicators like MACD, PPO, RSI as more leading indicators to figure out where the, the market may be going next. So I don't often use it there. Is it a good measure of short-term, uh, near-term momentum as you described it? Absolutely not. Because First Solar has been pegged as one of the top 1% of stocks for the last five months. Now, during that period, there's been a lot of near-term momentum shifts, right? Short-term strength and short-term weakness. So if that's what you're trying to capture, the scooter rankings aren't really going to aren't really designed to help you do that. That's designed to recognize the fact that First Solar is now one of the leading names pushing the market higher or fighting the downtrend in the market. I would use something like an RSI PPO on shorter term timeframes. If you're trying to pick out price swings, near term momentum, I would use, I would look elsewhere for some of those uh, insights, but I would use it in conjunction with the scooter ranking, which I think is fantastic. Really good question. Next question. When you chart SPY to ACWI, A-C-W-I, why does this chart reflect U.S. versus other markets? Doesn't ACWI include the U.S.? Anytime I show this chart, I get a question like this. So I'll try to explain myself and uh, and I appreciate uh, you, uh, you asking the question. So ACWI stands for All Country World Index. This is a uh, an index, boy, run by MSCI, if I remember right, but I might be messing that up. Sorry if I did. Yeah, iShares MSCI. It has it in the name of the ETF. So the ACWI index is an index that I used uh, for a long time when I was at an, on the institutional buy side because we would manage portfolios. And our benchmark would be something like MSCI ACWI or ACWI XUS, which is the All Country World Index, but removing the U.S. components. Um, ACWI is an ETF, an exchange-traded fund that tracks that ACWI index. So ACWI is basically everything. So here's what you can do. If you want to look at what the U.S. is looking at versus everything else, you have two options, right? Look at a ratio of the SPY versus everything. So look at U.S. versus global, which includes U.S. You can look at Europe versus global, Japan versus global, South America versus global. You can do all sorts of EM versus global. And you're sort of looking at one part of the whole pie versus the whole pie. That ratio is going to give you that sense. Or you can look at uh, one versus the other, right? Let me look at US SPY versus EFA, which would be developed Europe and uh, and the Middle East, and looking at the two of those together, right? So they're a different way. I mean, I, I think they generally get you to the same place. What I've tended to think of is Acqui is kind of everything. That is a way to get exposure to all global stocks. It's about 50% US. The other 50% are non-US, including developed and emerging markets. And by looking at a ratio of SPY versus Acqui, EFA versus Acqui, EM versus Acqui, you basically are taking each of those parts of the global equity environment versus the entire piece. It's just like looking at an individual stock versus the S&P. I'm looking at one name versus all of my universe. And that's why I look at that ratio. So I think it gets you to that answer pretty, pretty well. Next question. You have pointed out RSI divergences on your great show. And thank you for calling it great. I appreciate it for a while. How do you go about trading it theoretically? And I think probably you mean, how do you go about creating it practically, right? How do you actually execute based on some of those things? I mean, you know, like Netflix is probably an example of where we had an RSI divergence, uh, you know, back here, you, you've uh, you've seen it. Um, and actually just recently we highlighted this bull uh, bearish divergence, uh, which is more here. Bullish divergences, um, boy, I'm thinking, ooh, uh, what were a couple that we had? Um, Generac, I want to say, uh, GNRC was one that comes to mind. Let's look at that one. Yeah, this is the one I was thinking of. So Bullish momentum divergence is prices going lower, RSI going higher. So oversold when we make the new low in November, not oversold when we make subsequent new lows in December. That's lower prices, higher momentum. That's a bullish momentum divergence. How do you actually engage it? So I, it, it's really more of a of a, uh, of a a decision that's it's more of a, of a money management decision, I think, more than ever. If you think about it, we rarely on this show say, here's where you should buy and here's where you should sell. Number one, that is not what we're trying to do. We're not a financial advisor. You should do your own homework, disclaimers all around. Uh, but it's less about that. And it's more about the fact that I don't know you and your particular money management style. I don't know what your portfolio strategy is. I don't know what your time horizon is. So telling you particular levels and what you, how you should execute, that's more of a question you need to use. So I always think of technical anal analysis as giving you the tools you need. You need to figure out how you actually execute. That's a whole separate strategy of entry and exit points and money management strategy, what uh, percent of your capital you allocate to different things, how you manage risk um, and, and bet sizing and things like that. 
Generally speaking, the way I think of it, for what it's worth, is that uh, bullish and bearish divergences are a leading indicator. A lot of my toolkit is trend following. Things like moving averages and MACD and PPO are meant to confirm, right? It's not going to anticipate a bottom. It's going to confirm that something has already happened. And the idea is you're following the trend. You're missing the beginning of the move, but you're following the bigger part of the move. What something like a divergence does, it's more of a leading indicator. It tells you price is still going down, but we're starting to see the signs similar to market bottoms, which means you want to start engaging other indicators like the MACD, the PPO, see if it's able to break above moving averages, break above price resistance levels. Those are the sort of triggers. So, you know, the divergence puts it on a list. So I have a watch list of stocks. These are the stocks like Generac and others that have shown a bullish divergence. Now I'm going to watch those charts to see when the trigger actually occurs. So just taking a chart like this, and at the bottom putting something like PPO, and I've not looked at this yet, um, but here, yeah, a little different, right? So PPO actually, you had the bullish divergence. PPO actually led it a little bit, it's interesting. You actually saw the PPO rotate higher before that. A lot of times what happen is the divergence will occur. The trend following signal usually happens a little bit later. Here you can see we regained the 50-day moving average, really happened in the first week in January. So the divergence happened uh, first, and then a lot of times you can confirm that confirm that the trend has changed with other indicators. So you could take a speculative position at the beginning on the divergence, but I would always suggest wait for confirmation to validate that that signal was true. Those were some fantastic questions. We're budgeting a little more time for the mailbag and keep your great questions coming. We'll get to more next week, but for today, we got to wrap this week and wrap this show. Here's the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Chart number one is Netflix. And what I wanted to focus on on this particular chart of Netflix is how the left half of the chart and the right half of the chart look different. I've mentioned recently how the chart of Alphabet, if you look at 2021, a bull phase, 2022, a bear phase, so striking the differences. Flip that over and you have Netflix over the last uh, you know 15 months or so. Downtrend on the left half from the fourth quarter of 21 to the uh, really the third quarter of 2022. Look at how the RSI remains in the bearish phase, rarely, not really getting above 60 uh, on, on rallies. You see the relative strength consistently down. After July and we had that uh, bottom, look at how we changed. Lower lows to higher lows, lower highs to higher highs. The RSI breaks above 50 and now doesn't get above uh, below 40, right? So on pullbacks, the momentum stays fairly positive. Look at how the relative strength has been consistently strong. Netflix is a great example of the strength that is emerging in different areas of the market. Despite what the broader indexes do, it's always a good time to own good charts. That's my general approach. Chart number two, Synchrony Financial, ticker SYF. This is a consumer finance name in the financial sector. What's interesting about the chart of, uh, of SYF, I was looking at this uh, and thinking about uh, earnings, thinking about a lot of the banks that are reported and financial stocks, a number of them have really decent days. This is one of the top gainers in the S&P uh, today, up almost 9% from yesterday's close. We're making a new swing low intraday. What's interesting about this chart is, again, if you take a step back, you can see a uh, low in March. You can see a low in June, July. I'm going to draw a little line here to make this really obvious, right? Think of the low in March there. You see the low in May undercutting it. You see the low in June. We did not make a new low in September. All of a sudden, we've made a much higher low in December and January. Look at the highs here, right? So going lower, going lower, about the same. Now, all of a sudden, going higher. So lower lows and lower highs to higher lows and higher highs. The fact that we're coming off that low around 32 and rotating higher, again, the move higher today is interesting. The fact that it comes after a bounce off of 32, I think is what's really attractive about a chart like uh, SYF. Our final third and final chart for the three and three for today is small cap value versus large cap growth. This is using two of the Morningstar style buckets, basically Small cap value ticker IWN, large cap growth IVW. This line is going up. That tells you the smaller value oriented stocks are outperforming the large cap growth stocks. Large cap growth did great today with things like Netflix and others having a decent day. That's pushing the ratio just a little bit. The longer trend has been value over growth and small over large. Folks, that's a wrap for this week and a wrap for today. For stockcharts.com and Redmond Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, be safe. We'll see you on Monday. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.